Hey everyone, welcome back to Historical Quarrels. I'm your host, Tyler Eckhart. Today we're going to be continuing with part two of the story of Liu Pengli. And a little bit of a history lesson about the Han Dynasty still. We're going to be going over the reign of Emperor Jing, uh, Liu Pengli's uncle. Some of the context to the court politics going on uh, that provides a little bit more context to our story. We'll be going all over the life of his father. And then finally, the story and then accounts of Liu Peng Li. Let's go ahead and jump right into it, shall we? Let's go. You are listening to Historical Quarrels. Right, so we have the reign of Emperor Jing from 157 to 141 BC. Now, some background. Uh, Emperor Jing's smooth ascension to the throne can be primarily attributed to the stable foundation established during Emperor Wen's reign. Uh, and part of that is he he inherited a well-governed and stable empire from his father, Emperor Wen. The stability was crucial in ensuring a smooth transition of power, contrast to the tumultuous succession seen in many other uh, dynastic periods, normally, primarily with the Qin. Uh, <clears throat> and the effective policies of Emperor Wen, particularly in the terms of economic stability and moral governance played a significant role in the ease of Emperor Jing's ascension. The empire was not only economically prosperous, but also enjoyed a period of social harmony, making the transition less susceptible to internal strife and power struggles. And uh, Emperor Wen's uh, grandma was not really digging around anymore in there, wasn't trying to like mess with some shit. So it's great. Okay. And then as the crown prince, Emperor Jing would have been prepared for his role as emperor. Uh, this preparation likely included education and governance, philosophy, especially Confucianism, because that was that was the shit back then. That was what everybody was into. And military strategy, equipping him with the skills needed to lead the empire effectively. <clears throat> um, but yeah, so as far as like his reign goes, uh, he upheld his father's economic policies uh, most of the legal reforms as well, and fo focus on public welfare, welfare and even expanded it. Emperor Jing, like his father, would place great emphasis on the well-being of his subjects. He implemented policies aimed at improving the lives of the common people, such as maintaining stable grain prices and implementing relief efforts during natural disasters. So go him. He was he was a good, good emperor. He also um, wanted to strengthen central authority. And this is something that will come into play later as uh, Liu Pengli, Li Wu's father, would be in charge of the Jidong province, or kind of labeled as the king. And these were seen as external threats to the central authority of the emperor. And so the court was, during this time, especially with Emperor Jing, really trying to focus on maintaining power, uh, main maintaining central authoritative power. So, <clears throat> one of Emperor Jing's major actions was to curtail the power of regional feudal lords, many of whom were relatives and had been granted autonomy during the reigns of his predecessors. He systematically reduced their military power and political autonomy, which were seen as potential threats to central authority. Now this, and because of like his policies doing this, would, be, would come back later uh, for historians to kind of point at this and be like, so Liu Peng Li's story might have been fabricated because they were just trying to oust him and get him out of that kind of like spot, that throne, essentially. Emperor Jing also implemented reforms that altered the way regional areas were governed. He replaced the semi-autonomous feudal states with uh, commanderies and prefectures directly controlled by central government. This restructuring allowed for greater administrative control and efficiency from the central, I guess, court, essentially. And then to further consolidate central authority, Emperor Jing took steps to centralize military power. He reduced the private armies of the feudal lords and strengthened the central imperial army, ensuring that the military power was firmly under the control of the central government. Which is smart. Um, kind of like in last episode, I pointed out like, hey, you know, it's kind of weird to let all these other guys build up their armies and potentially get stronger than you because one day they're going to be like, well, why, why am I not king? And then come in to mess you up. So by Jing doing this, he, he, I think he probably realized the mistake of letting people do that. And was like, well, I don't want that to happen, so no, no more armies for you. 
That's what happened here. So, in addition to that, Emperor Jing also continued and expanded upon land distribution. But yeah, yeah he was like super into agriculture. Um, <clears throat> he also invested in agricultural infrastructure, such as the construction and maintenance, I mean, maintenance of granaries and irrigation systems. These infrastructures were crucial for storing surplus grain and managing water sources, both of which were vital for consistent agricultural production. Those who aren't farmers, irrigation systems still used today. Very, very important. But more importantly than the agriculture, not only did he help uh, that, Ben Jing would be known for privately starting up whorehouses. Um, at first, these whorehouses were just for him on his travels, and he had them set up throughout the land. So as he's going through his travels or, you know, visiting different providences, he could stop at the whorehouses and, you know, get his nut in, relax, have fun in each providence. But eventually his advisor, uh, Yong Eng, would eventually inform him of the potentially economic prosperity they could bring in if they, allow, if they allowed the women to sell themselves to others in the land. And at first, Emperor Jing was hesitant, oh, excuse me, stating that the woman would keep all the money, though, you know, he's gonna, what would the point be? Then y Yang Eng responded, telling the emperor, mm, these hoes out here making money because you told them to, son. See, what they gotta understand is that you can go gorilla on their asses should they go around and start acting like a bunch of renegades. If they do start up, we can get some madams to make sure that these bitches stay in line. You feel me, Jing? And then Jing said, fuck it. I guess I'm in the game now, son. And then Jing and Yong Eng would make a lot of money. And uh, internationally, Yong Eng would later become recognized as the father of the modern pip game. Um, and all of his slang words would be used even to this day. Just crazy. And clearly, I am just messing around with you <laughs> with the whole pimp stuff. Uh, but actually, Jing's son, Emperor Wu, would be the first in the Han Dynasty to institutionalize prostitution by recruiting female camp followers for his armies. These women were called Ying Ji, Qi, or camp harlots. Uh, some would place the institution of camp followers still earlier in the Warring States period when the King of Yui established a widow's camp on a mountain to supply sexual outlets for his armies. Which, you know, that's a good thing. I bet those wid widows were also a little bit sexually frustrated and getting some strong military men was probably good for them. Possibly setting uh, the precedent for Emperor Wu's <coughs> camp harlots, uh, these widows. So, you know, you got to keep your men happy. And what better way to do that by than by making sure they are constantly ejaculating is uh, the number one way to keep a man happy. Through these measures, Emperor Jing ensured that agriculture <laughs> remained a priority for the Han Dynasty, contributing to the empire's economic strength and the well-being of its, its people. As well um, as agriculture, there is trade and economic prosperity. His reign saw the growth of trade and commerce, uh, both internally and along the Silk Road. Under Emperor Jing specifically, the Silk Road really began to flourish as a major trade route connecting China with Central Asia, the Middle East, and beyond. This route facilitated the exchange of goods like silk, spices, and ceramics from China, and brought in gold, silver, and other exotic items from the West. This is, a, is really, really good for <laughs> the empire here. But not only with international trade, we had a lot of internal trade expansion as well. Uh, domestically, the Han Dynasty also saw significant growth. The stability provided by Emperor Jing's governance and his emphasis on inf infrastructure, such as roads and canals, improved transportation, and connectivity connectivity within the empire. This improvement allowed for easier movement of goods and contributed to the growth of internal markets and trade networks. And it's kind of weird. When people feel safe, it lets them feel like they can move around more and you know do more things. Whereas if you feel not safe, you're going to stick to a certain spot and stay in that spot. That's what fear does to you. But above all, because of all this, we had a lot of economic diversification and urbanization. This era really saw the diversification of the Han economy with the growth of various industries such as metallurgy, textiles, and pottery. The increased trade and economic activity also led to urbanization, 
with cities becoming centers of commerce and cultural exchange. Zhidong would be one of those big cities, big centers, big provinces. Um, the, uh, a lot of wealth in it, which again, and we'll kind of get more into this later, leads me to believe there is a potential that uh, Liu Pengli's story was fabricated. But there's a lot of stuff that goes against it, and a lot of stuff that goes for for it being fabricated. Well, we'll get into it at the very end after I tell all the story. Sorry, I just get a little ahead of myself. I get a little excited because I'm like, ooh, this is juicy. This is juicy details. It's like high school drama, but with like emperors in the past. Uh, so dumb. Uh, anyways. Okay. Um, more importantly, with Emperor Jing, we had a very defensive military posture. Uh, he maintained a largely defensive um, military, focusing on protecting the Empire's borders rather than expansionist wars. He didn't really care about expanding. He was like, we're big enough. We're going to keep this army strong um, <laughs> and, you know, just making sure that we, we have enough people out and about to prote protect our borders from rivals. While focusing on this defense, Emperor Jing ensured the main maintenance of strong and well-prepared Standing army, this force was crucial for quickly responding to any threats along the borders and maintaining internal stability as well, which is very important. This was uh, this would help reduce the overall chances of succession disputes, um, you know, rebellions against them. Um, and in line with this non-aggression stance, Emperor Jing also utilized diplomacy to maintain peace and security. He continued to engage in di diplomatic relations and marriage alliances with neighboring states. And nomadic troop groups using these tools to ensure stability and peace along the borders. Married off multiple of his daughters to, um, you know, barbarian men, uh, and uh, this is where you know a lot of a lot of those barbarian men would start to become a little bit more civilized because the daughters would be like, "No, I don't want to sleep with you." And then um, he taught them, he taught he taught them really good like warf warfare strategies, uh, particularly with the mental game, and he taught them the subtle art of gaslighting. And so the, the his daughters would gaslight the the barbarian men into thinking that they you know didn't actually want to sleep with them and that you know it was their choice like they were just too tired and that's what they'd already told them and you know they'd be like hey you know you already told me you're too tired for this like no that's okay we don't need to we don't need to have sex and the barbarian would be like what what I did what and then just go to sleep and uh, this would happen for years until eventually the barbarian men were like what no 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 I know for a fact I said I wanted to have sex. Anyways. <laughs> uh, part of these marriage alliances, um, as they were part of the Hekin policy, Emperor Jing continued his practice of arranging marriages between Han princesses and Zhang Nu leaders. If you remember from last time, the Zhang Nu were another bordering empire that w they would occasionally run into conflicts with, but Emperor Wen and Jing preferred peace over war. And then accompanying the marriage alliances, the Han Dynasty provided, uh, provided the Zhang Nu with gifts, goods, and sometimes even monetary tribute. This exchange was not only a gesture of goodwill, but also a means to facilitate trade and economic interactions, which were beneficial for both parties. So by spending money, he made more money, essentially, by doing that. And also maintained the border stability, helped maintain his uh, government overall. Okay. Then... Emperor Jing was also a big, very into Confucianism, continuing on with his, you know, father and forefathers. They loved Confucian Confucianism. And Confucianism, as we, as we have come to learn, is very particular in rehabilitation. Which is another proponent as to why Liu Pengli, if he did commit his crimes, would have been exiled and not just outright executed. Confucianism's kind of like, no, morally, like, you know, people can reform, they can change, they can be better. At least that's the idea. But these ideals were integrated into the governance of the state and very important. There's a lot of education about it as well, um, encouraging the study of Confucian texts and principles. Its focus on education helped to disseminate Confucian ideals throughout the empire, influencing not only just the ruling class, but also the general populace. And under Emperor Jing, Confucian principles like benevolence, righteousness, and uh, filial pi uh, piety were increasingly reflected in the empire's legal and administrative policies. This alignment of governance with Confucian ethics helped to solidify the moral legitimacy of his rule. He's a benevolent king, I guess. 
father, like his father and grandfather before him. Uh, just again, this is the idea of like benevolent. Okay, now that we have a good idea of what Emperor Jing's rule was like and the court dynamics at play, um, as well as the culture that was going on at the time, back up a little bit, back to 184 BC, to the birth of Liu Wu, Emperor Jing's brother and the father of Liu Peng Li. So the birth of Liu Wu in 184 BC is a very notable event in the context of the Western Han Dynasty, primarily due to his later role as the King of Liang and as the father of Liu Peng Li. Liu's, Liu Wu's life and position in the Han Dynasty's royal family provide insights into a lot of shit. Uh, <laughs> a, a lot of different things at play here, as we'll see. Basically, because of what Peng Li's father did, is what, for me, brings into question if Liu Peng Li was just a... His story was just fabricated at all. Personally, for me. And for other historians as well. I shouldn't call myself a historian. I'm more of like a... More of like a fanboy of historians. I'm like, like, like I'm a... You know, fuck, I'll, I'll figure out the term later. Okay, <clears throat> so as a member of the Imperial Liu family, Liu Wu was closely connected to the central figures of the Han Dynasty. His status as a nephew of Emperor Jing and a cousin of Emperor Wu, sorry, I guess not brother, cousin, it gets really confusing. I was like looking at the chart <laughs> and yeah, no, so Emperor Jing's father, so like um, he was a nephew of Emperor Wu. So yeah, Emperor Wu's brother had Liu Wu and yeah, so and I just... I got that mixed up. My bad. <laughs> fine. It's fine. They're related and they were close. They're closely related. <laughs> Anyways. So, it meant that he was a part of the inner circle of the dynasty's ruling family, which came with both privileges and responsibilities. It's very important that he was born into it. Again, he was a contender for a lot of different things. He was even a contender for being the emperor based off of his lineage. Uh, <clears throat> there isn't a lot of information about Liu Wu's early life, uh, but as a member of the royal family, who had been brought up in luxurious surroundings of the royal court, receiving education befitting a prince. So, eventually he does become appointed as King of Liang. So, as the King of Liang, Liu Wu held significant autonomy over his region. This autonomy included the ability to govern, local affairs, oversee the administration of justice, and manage the economic activities within his domain. Such autonomy allowed him considerable influence and power, albeit under the overarching authority of the Han central government. Liu Wu's role as regional king involved substantial risks as well. He was tasked with maintaining law and order, ensuring the collection of taxes, and overseeing local government officials. Additionally, he would have been responsible for implementing central government policies and directives in his region. If he failed to do so, he would have been found guilty of treason. And in addition to this as well, he would have had some military responsibilities, though this was being reduced at the time due to Emperor Jing's policies of reducing just how much military he could have and like what, you know, how, how important it was. But, <clears throat> uh, so as we continue on with that... We need to kind of get into his personal life and family. So here about circa 165 BC, we'll have um, well, probably like 160 BC. We have Liu Pengli, uh, who is one of Liu Wu's sons or well, 165 BC, who is uh, who became an infamous tyrannical ruler, as mentioned in the Book of Han, you know, who this story is all about. But we, he also had some other children who didn't have anything fabricated or any scandals told about them, right? So with Liu Pengli being the most well-documented of Liu Wu's children, there's a couple other details about his other sons or daughters in primary texts like the CG and the Hanshu. The lack of information about coups or significant political actions involving Liu, Liu, Liu Wu's other children suggests they, may not, they might not have been involved in notable political intrigues or upheavals, at least not to the extent that was recorded in those other historical texts, but Liu Wu was the third son. Uh, uh, <clears throat> sorry, Liu Pengli was the third son of Liu Wu. His brothers included Liu Wu's other sons included included Liu Mai, Liu Ming, Liu Ding, and Liu Bu Shi. 
Now, during during Liu Wu's reign, eventually there would be a rebellion for against Emperor Jing. Okay, so after Emperor Jing ordered the execution of Chao Kuo at the urging of Yuan Eng, uh, his uh, pimp buddy, Liu Wu was besieged at his capital of Suiyang by the armies of Wu and Chu during the rebellion of the Seven States. Now, the rebellion overall, uh, I guess, let me go ahead and give you a prelude to the rebellion, because it is a important event um, around 175 to 179 BC, while when Emperor Jing was still crowned prince, uh, Qi, Liu Pi's heir, apparent Liu Xian, uh, Xian had been in a, had been on an official visit to the capital of Chang'an, and they completed a Liu Bu board game. I know it was a board game. Uh, <clears throat> is an ancient Chinese board game for two players. The rules have largely been lost. Uh, nobody knows what it looks like, but uh, you have like little. You had six game pieces that were moved around points of a square uh, game board that had a distinctive symmetrical pattern and moves were determined by a throw of six sticks, which is, you know, this sounds cool. It sounds interesting. I'd probably play it because I love board games. Anyways, during arguments over the game, Liu Xian, I, I, this, this <laughs> rebellion's caused by a fucking argument over a board game. This is amazing. Anyways, he offended Crown Prince Qi or Emperor Jing, who beat him to death with the board. <laughs> Oh, so good. So <clears throat> Liu Pi hated Emperor Jing for causing the death of Liu Xian. Uh, Emperor Jing's <coughs> key advisor, Chao Ku, suggested using uh, using as excuses, using as excuses offenses that the princes had committed, which had generally been ignored by Emperor Wen, uh, that he had cut down the sizes of the principalities to make them less threatening. Chao explicitly con contemplated the possibility that Wu and other principalities might rebel, but justified the action by asserting that if they were going to rebel, it would be better for them to let them rebel earlier than later when they might be more prepared. So he's like, if we, you know, don't give them time to prepare the rebellion, let them rebel now. They're, they're, they're going to be a little bit uh, weaker by doing this. <clears throat> so... Emperor Jing would have about 360,000 troops and there would be about 200,000 Wu troops and 300,000 <laughs> troops from other states overall when all other when all of the other seven, seven states rebelled against him. So, yeah. Um <clears throat> Yeah, lots of lots of fun. But anyways, um when Liu Wu was besieged during this, during the rebellion of the Southern States, his mother, the Empress uh, Dowager Xiaohuan, uh, urged the emperor to send the imperial army to re relieve him. The general Zhao Yafu succeeded in counseling against a direct assault. Instead, his force took advantage of disorder among the rebe rebels to establish a strong camp at Jiayi, or modern modern day Dangshan in Anhui. Athwart, uh, athwart their line of supply and communication along the Sea River, ignoring Liu Wu's pleas for help and imperial order, orders to advance the city, he occupied his time strengthening his defenses and sending Han Tui Dung's cavalry raiders to disrupt what little overland supply the rebels could manage from Chu. Just, you know, that's good. It's a good move. This is what you should be doing. So, having wearied, uh, wearied their armies, assaulting Sui Yang. The rebel princes were forced to fall back for supplies and their assaults on the Jiayi were defeated with such prepared ease that J Shu initially refused to be woken for bed. <laughs> I love these stories. Like, these guys are so sassy. They're like, nah, we, we, we got this. Don't even wake me up, man. I'm fine. Uh, which, because of this, this was effectively the end of the rebellion. And the prince of Chu took his own life and Liu Pi was killed by uh, UN natives as he fled. You know, uh, nobody, they didn't like him. Uh, they, <clears throat> uh, the, and by the way, the UA were various ethnic groups who inhabited the regions of Southern China and Northern Vietnam during the first millennium BC. Uh, and then they were, mm, you know, they, they lived there all their lives. It's Luan Bu followed this by defeating the other rebel, rebel pr princes who chose either death or execution. The successful strategy earned Zhou Yafu the wrath of the Prince of Liang and his mother, however. They eventually succeeded in poisoning the Emperor uh, <laughs> poisoning the emperor against him, and he was imprisoned on minor issues involving his son's dispute with a supplier, and in the end, 
chose to fast to death in prison. He starved himself to death. So, but <clears throat> for for Liu Wu's support during the rebellion, uh, Emperor Jing gave him many honors and privileges. His private gardens, Liu Wu's, rivaled that of the emperor's, and the prince expanded his number of retainers, bringing in Yang Sheng, uh, Gong Song Gui, and Zui Yang. And he became a famous patron, particularly of Fu, uh, and Fu, which is off, often translated as Rhapsody or Poetic Exposition, is a form of Chinese rhymed prose that was dominant literary form in China during the Han Dynasty. Fu are intermediary pieces between poetry and prose uh, in which a place, object, feeling, or other subject is described and rhapsodized uh, during the kind of poem thing. So he really liked that. He was like, this is... This is my shit, man. Um, one of the famous poets that he uh, was a patron of was Sima Zhengru, a Chinese musician, poet, and politician, a very important and influential. One particularly influential piece was the memorial from prison to the Prince of Liang, whereby Zhou Yang su- successfully pleaded his case against the slander of other courtiers and freed himself from a death sentence, not by addressing the charges against him, but by multiplying historical examples of the disaster of gossip and libel. He's like, hey, you know, like, you don't want to be known as the guy who killed the innocent dude. That, like, that's, it's kind of bad. It kind of suck. Someone called you that. And the emperor was like, you know, what? that's, um, that's right. And Liu Wu funded that. So, um, and so his influence was definitely gaining at court and, uh, people were starting to get a little scared of it. They weren't, they weren't liking it. And uh, before before I kind of get more into this, I'm going to go into now the birth of Liu Pengli, uh, which was likely around 165 BC. Uh, he also, uh, because of his station and because of all the shit that was going on, uh, as the son of Liu Wu, King of Liang, and relative to Emperor Jing, Liu Pengli and his siblings were born into a world of privilege and power. They grew up wanting nothing. They needed nothing. They had everything taken care of for them uh, with a lot of rights and luxuries that were unavailable to everybody else in the kingdom. Liu Pengli also had a lot of education, particularly with literature and history. It would have been very extensive in the studies of history, involved learning the classics, historical texts, and possibly poetry, especially with Liu Wu loving, loving poetry. Obviously, philosophy and Confucian texts, uh, he would have had martial arts training, come in there being like wacha, wacha, when he was killing people he'd probably like snap their neck or you know like you know with uh, that thing from kill bill where she just goes bah, 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 and it like explodes his heart or something um and most importantly one of liu uh, liu peng li's tutors was yang shen sheng who would get his yang sheng would get liu wu liu peng li's father into a lot of trouble <clears throat> he was one of the main tutors for liu wu's children uh, his role as tutor would have been significant in shaping their intellectual and moral development. And knowing what this guy does later, the moral development kind of, you know, makes a little more sense about why those stories might have come into play. And uh, <clears throat> because of this, there would have been a lot of expectations of loyalty and service. So you, he would have been expected to be loyal to the emperor, had some administrative responsibilities growing up, maybe a little bit of military leadership, just kind of a tiny bit, especially with you know, after the rebellion of the seven states. Would have had some governance in the roles in the regions. Uh, again, very privileged lifestyle. Uh, he would have more than likely, you know, had a political marriage happen with him. There's nothing directly stated about that. So, which I really did try to look into. I was like, who, is the, who the fuck was he married to? <laughs> it's fine. Um, the status also would have made Liu Pengli subjects to envy and political intrigue. Uh, royal families often found themselves entangled in power struggles, both within the family and external political factions. So there was a lot of external political factions going on here, and um, there is going to be a lot of issues coming up here soon with uh, <laughs> being Liu Wu's son. Okay, so we're going to get into... Uh, a big event that happens in 154 BC or 150 BC, uh, which is going to be Liu Wu's fall from grace. So when Emperor Jing demoted his eldest son, Liu Rong, uh, Rong from heir apparent to the prince of Linjiang, 
The Empress Dowager took the occasion of an imperial feast to demand that Emperor Jing name Liu Wu as his crown prince in preference to his other sons, which Emperor Jing immediately agreed. However, he was talked out of it later by his advisors. Yuan Eng, in particular, counseled strongly against breaking the laws of succession, as the act would set a highly destabilizing precedent. Um, I don't know if you guys listened to any of my earlier episodes, but if you remember the episode on the Ottoman Empire and the Turks, and how <laughs> after they kind of did away with primogeniture, and instead it was kind of like a survival of the fittest for all of the sons or brothers of the current um, sultan, all the shit that went on because of that. You know, this was probably a smart move, honestly, by Yuan Ang. Uh, <laughs> just being like, listen, no, we, we, we keep the, we keep, we keep it going. We set that president, right? Don't, don't mess with it. Otherwise, there's going to be a lot of, a uh, lot of power struggles going on here. And our empire is going to fall apart, fall apart in about a hundred years. So because of Yuan Ang doing this, uh, acting in support of their patron, Gong Sun Gui and Yang Shen conspired to have this elderly minister stabbed to death. <laughs> That's right. Stabbed to death outside the walls of the imperial suburb of Anyiling. Uh, they were responsible for nine related murders as well. Which and the, these guys were tutoring. This, this, was, this was the guy tutoring Liu Pengli. So it kind of makes more sense why he might have been murdering people because... Yang Shen was probably teaching him, like, listen, someone steps on your toes, kid, you kill that son of a bitch. You hear me? And Liu Ping was like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> like... So upon the emperors discovering their involvement, Liu Wu ordered them to commit suicide and presented their bodies to the emperor, I'm, which I'm surprised they both were like, yeah, cool, I'll kill myself. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so crazy to me. Some of these, like, old stories, they really mess with me because it's like... You know, today you would think of people that were willing to commit murder just, you know, being like, nah, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. I did this for you, dog. <laughs> Anyways, um, even though the people who conspired to do this and definitely acted outside of Liu Wu's, um, you know, over, overseeing this, Liu Wu never regained uh, Emperor Jing's favor and was only seldom received at court. So, instead, following custom, Liu Che, the prince of Zhao Dong, was promoted to crown prince and his mother, Lady Wang, to empress. So, afraid for her younger son's life, the empress Dowager refused to eat until he was cleared of any charges. The official charged, <laughs> the official charged with the investigation reported back to Emperor Jing that, in his view, Liu Wu had been involved in that Sparing the prince of Liang would break the law of Han. Nonetheless, killing him would deeply distress the empress and upset the emperor even more. Because, uh, you know, Emperor Jing did, did seem to like Liu Wu. He was going to be, he was totally cool with making him the crown prince. <laughs> so he counseled the emperor to drop the issue in discussion with the empress. Uh, he blamed the murder solely upon the two courtiers and explained they had already been lawfully punished. So he, and then Beijing was like, okay, cool. So he went ahead and exiled Liu Wu, stripped him of his title. And <clears throat> Liu Wu would eventually die at home in 144 BC after a trip to Chang'an. His memorial uh, to Emperor Jing asking to extend his stay at the capital was rejected and took ill soon after returning home. He was around 40 years old. His estate at his death was estimated to include 400,000 cattle. Uh, Cantees of gold and an equivalent amount of wealth in land. If true, and assuming the gold was pure, this fortune would be equivalent to more than $30 billion today, US dollars, which was insane. <clears throat> uh, anyways, his mother, the Empress Dowager, was at first inconsolable about, uh, you know, his, her baby boy dying. Uh, and <clears throat> You know, because of her crying and stuff, Emperor Jing decided to placate her by dividing the realm of Liang into five pieces, bestowing them upon Li Wu's, Liu Wu's sons. And this is where Liu Peng Li, again, grandson of Emperor Wen, would uh, become the prince of Jidong, one of the, you know, providences of Liang that was divided by 
Emperor Jing. So now we are finally into the main story. So congrats, guys. You you did it. You made it. You made it here. And you understand a, a lot more context to what's going on than you would normally understand. So you know what? You should be proud of yourselves. Give yourselves a pat on the back. You know, give yourself a quick high five as we get into this, this tale. So, <clears throat> Liu Bengli's inheritance of his father's title and lands, some of them, marked his transition into a significant role in the Han dynasty. This event was not only crucial in his personal life, but also indicative of the broader dynamics of power, governance, and responsibility in the Han dynasty's feudal system. So, <clears throat> first, uh, as the king of Jidong, we, we know that he, he, he abused his power a little bit, you know, just a tiny bit. According to historical texts like the Book of Han, or Han Shu, Liu Pengli used his position to commit acts of murder and robbery. He reportedly led a band of followers on night raids, terrorizing and pillaging his own people. These action were, actions were not just abuses of his power, but also violations of the moral and legal codes of, of the Han dynasty. Some stories of his terror included him sneaking into people's homes um, and supposedly putting on a wig, and then pretending to be the spouse of the man of the home that he snuck into and having sex with them. Um, and then after the man finished, he would take off his wig and yell, ha ha, I got you. And then drag them out onto the street and uh, make them watch as he killed each member of their family in front of the dude he just let come inside of his ass. You know, um, you know, maybe he didn't fuck him, but he, he would drag people out, uh, have his like, have his little gang hold the, the guy down and then just murdered the family. And supposedly not like, you know, feeling anything, seeming like he was. Kind of like in a trance. Uh, other accounts say he would just walk in and stab someone and walk out like nothing happened. And a few seconds later, the victims of his stabbings would walk out holding their guts and shit, you know, just <laughs> spilling out. Craziness. But <clears throat> besides the murder, um, it, <laughs> his rule is characterized by extreme cruelty and oppression. Folklore and tales from the, that era depict him as a ruler who took pleasure in the suffering of others, often inflicting punishment and pain without just cause. His tyranny became a symbol of despotic rule and in later historical na narratives. You know, you kind of get compared. If you, want, if you wanted to point out uh, a tyrant, you, you call him a Liu Peng Li. They were acting like a Liu Peng Li. That's, this guy was like the father of tyrants. Accounts of him doing, um, doing this are few, but one story tells of a farmer that he had ripped apart via horses pulling his limbs off because the farmer reportedly did not have an erection while meeting him which I totally think is reasonable. I too expect every man that I meet to gain and maintain a full rock hard erection while I'm talking, talking to them. And they, sh and should they lose that erection at any point during our conversation, that conversation is fucking over. And I'll know they are not respecting my time. And clearly my conversation is not stimulating enough for them. And you know, if I were a king, I'd say that that deserves death. Uh, it is uh, more than a, Fair punishment for disrespecting someone like that. Every goddamn day. Just, I just wish more people would just maintain a boner while talking to me. I don't. It's not that hard. I do it. I do it just out of respect for people. I just walk up to them, you know, fully erect. I'm like, hey, you know, I'm going to stay erect for you while we're talking. I look them in the eye, too, as I'm talking to them, fully erect. And some people just don't have that courtesy to do that back, you know? It's just, it's fucking rude. Anyways. So the fear that Liu Pengli instilled in, instilled in his subjects was profound. Stories tell of people living in constant terror, unsure when they might become victims of Liu Pengli's next act of violence. This climate of fear disrupted the social and economic stability of Jidong. Some things he did to instill fear besides the murder rape, unjust punishments, you know, uh, was jumping out of bushes randomly to scare the peasants in his kingdom. You know, he would uh, just sit and wait for someone to walk past and then you go, bah! Reportedly, he actually scared someone to death by doing that once. And I'm sure modern doctors would have determined that the guy who died probably just had a heart condition or something. Because I don't know. There's not that many reports of like old people dying in haunted house, like, you know, like, there's like haunted house horror attractions. We you pay for it. What is it? Is it it's, called, it's just called a haunted house, right? And you, I, I don't know. Is there a name for um, 
know, like Castle of Chaos here in Utah. I'm trying to think what it's called. But you like pay to go inside and people try and scare you. Why, man, my brain right now. This is so embarrassing. And I'm doing it live. I'm not even doing it live. I'm doing it on camera. I could edit this out, but I don't know if I'm going to. Uh, <laughs> I can't remember what it's called. Ah! <laughs> I think it's just called a hound of the house. Shit. <laughs> Whatever. Anyways, yeah, um, in addition to this, obviously Liu Bengli had a lack of regard for justice. He didn't he didn't give a shit. Complete disregard for justice and the well-being of subjects. He's portrayed as a ruler who pri- prioritized his own whims and desires over the laws of the land and the basic rights of his people. Because, you know, fuck those people. They weren't rich. They weren't king. They don't get special treatment. Fuck them. Uh, but yeah, as far as the extent of his crimes, um, they are recorded in historical texts, particularly the Book of Han, and embellished in folklore. Uh, these paint a picture of a ruler who engaged in heinous acts against his own subjects, seemingly for sport and per- or personal amusement. Uh, some of the main details are rampant murder and theft. Uh, he would just steal, he, like he was the richest guy there, and he would go and steal from people just for fun. <laughs> Historical accounts state that Liu Pengli, along with his band of followers, his little robber bandits, essentially, would have roamed his domain, committing acts of murder and theft. These were not isolated incidents, but a repeated pattern of behavior that spread terror among the populace. Uh, it suggested that some accounts that Liu Pengli committed these crimes for sport or pleasure, reveling in a, de- a deeply cruel and sadistic nature. He's depicted as taking pleasure in the fear and suffering he caused, which only added to his infamy. Um... You know, he, the, some accounts would say that he, it would look like he was in the midst of the throes of passion or, you know, having sex, essentially, while he was watching someone scream or cry or act out of fear or dying, uh, quite literally, probably ejaculating any time someone died in front of him. His robes were noted as a, having a very musty kind of creamy smell to them and a wet, sticky spot where a penis would typically be located. A lot of the folklore ta- tales excuse me, about Liu Pingli often amplify his brutal actions, portraying him as a near mythical figure of evil, like some sort of like demon shadow coming out of nowhere to, you know, fuck you and then kill you. <laughs> something like a weird incubus sort of thing. <laughs> These stories sometimes describe him as a night marauder who would descend upon villages, leaving a trail of destruction and bloodshed in his wake. Burning houses, because why not? Killing men, women, and children, because it was fun. You know, the burning houses down part, uh, I I will be honest, part of me understands that a little bit. Because, uh... You know, I like to think the the reason why I understand this is because I have a lot of Viking DNA. And daily, it's just begging me to go out raiding and murdering Catholic priests. Which, knowing what I know you know, now about a good chunk of uh, those Catholic priests. And no longer seems like all that evil of a desire that I, you know, that I have, and maybe I shouldn't be repressing as much, you know, just so deep down into my core. Since I have a pretty good shot of killing a child molester or two, if I just targeted Catholic priests. I actually like a lot of priests, not all, well, maybe not all Christian priests, but you know, quite a few, quite, quite a few churches. For some reason, they're just really into child touching, and it's really sad. It's uh, a bit disturbing. So my Viking DNA just sometimes calls out to me, you know, and it's like, hey, go go raid them. Maybe the Vikings just knew how weird all those priests were, and you know, they probably just had a good vibe check about, oh, that guy's probably a child molester, let's go kill him. <laughs> let's just target them and raid their uh, warehouses. They have a lot of money, too, so it's kind of win-win <laughs> for everybody, including the peasants. <laughs> Because their kids aren't getting touched anymore. <laughs> uh, anyways, <clears throat> the fear that Liu Pengli instilled in his own people was profound. Folk tales describe communities living in constant terror, never knowing when or where he would strike next. The climate of fear significantly disrupted the social and economic fabric of Zhidong, which obviously pissed off people in the capital. Uh, They're noticing, hey, Zhidong's not bringing in as much money anymore. What the? F- What's going on there? What the hell? <laughs> But, um, <clears throat> so besides that, let's get into the victim count. It's because really with serial killers, it's a, it's a numbers game. Am I right? 
Like the the higher number count you have, the cooler you are. Uh, that's why everyone liked that uh, Christian Janimbertega episode. I'm guessing because uh, dude had nearly a thousand kills under his belt, which is nuts. So uh, Liu Peng Lee's is much smaller, much smaller. He does not have as big of a murder dick as Christian Janimbertega did. So, but he did have a large number of victims. The Book of Han indicates that Liu Peng Li was con- was responsible for a considerable number of deaths. And although exact figures are not provided, the text suggests a high death toll resulting from his actions. Some accounts and interpretations of these texts claim that Liu Peng Li was responsible for the deaths of over 100 people. It could be a couple hundred people, or it could be like 10 people. <laughs> Who knows? This figure, while not precisely verified, underscores the widespread and severe nature of his atrocities. Um, also, part of this number being unknown... Uh, and this is because we're not sure of who was considered to be people back then due to the Han Dynasty's class system. I shit you not, this is an actual problem with like totaling up the number of his kills. Those at the bottom of the class system were un- who were unskilled workers and or slaves were not typically counted as people per se in these books. So if he actually did commit these crimes, I would imagine, you know, over the course of his reign, he killed a lot more than probably just 100, more than likely. So beyond these killings, Peng Li's actions caused widespread fear and suffering among his subjects. His reign was marked by a climate of terror that affected many more beyond those who were directly victimized. Um, <clears throat> and there's a lot of historical interpretations. So the extent of his crimes have been subject to interpretation primarily, with some accounts possibly amplifying the scale of his tr- atrocities and others dimin- uh, diminishing it or you know, outright saying it was a fabrication. However, even conservative estimates portray a reign characterized by significant violence and cruelty. So more than likely, something something did happen. May not have been as cruel, but, you know, eh. <laughs> we're going to get that. So now we have um, his exposure. This is how he gets caught. So the, uh, the turning point came when a relative of one of Liu Peng Li's victims uh, courageously reported his atro- atrocities to the imperial authorities. This act of reporting was significant as it involved bringing the accusations against a member of the royal family to the highest level of government. More than likely, to me, this states that Peng Li killed someone with some connections. So that's that's where he messed up, you know, getting caught. He killed, he got a little too ambitious, a little too, you know, reckless and probably killed... Someone that was related to a noble, (laughs) more than likely. They're like, you know, and uh, that that that's how it gets out. Uh, In addition to this, this victim would have had a quite the journey to Chang'an, which is the capital of the Han Dynasty. And to report such crimes would have been a daunting endeavor, which really reflected the severity of Liu Pengli's actions and the desperation of his subjects for justice. So they would have like had to leave. Hopefully not get killed on the road to Chang'an from uh, from the Providence and uh, report it still. So that's uh, that's great. And, you know, because of everything going on and people wanting to have more control in the central government, the reception of the complaint um, was uh, very critical. Um, It demonstrated the central government's willingness to take action against royal family members if the conduct was deemed sufficiently egregious. And they took it very, very seriously. Following the report, an investigation was conducted to ascertain the veracity of the claims. Given uh, Liu Pengli's royal status, this investigation would have been a delicate matter, balancing the need for justice with the implications of prosecuting a member of the imperial family. So some things might not have been directly reported to the em- emperor initially, but it was eventually done. So... <clears throat> Upon hearing of these crimes, Jing was a little bit outraged. Such such actions by a member of the royal family were not only criminal, but also a gross violation of the Confucian moral code that the Han Dynasty purported to uphold. Again, Confucianism at this point had been like a couple hundred years deep of like culture embedded. Like this is how you live. This is this is the right stuff. This is this is what we do. So the court's reaction to the revelations about Liu Pengli's conduct was, uh, again, of course, shock and outrage. His actions were seen as a very stark violation of the expectations of someone in the royal family. And again, with all these violations of Confucian e- ethics, 
Confucian, uh, Confucianism emphasized moral rectitude, benevolence, and righteousness, especially in leaders. So Liu Pingli's actions were a direct affront to these principles and were of like a higher, I guess, like importance of like crime. Because like if a peasant killed people, you know, that's only a peasant doing it, but Peng Li was royal and had all these responsibilities and um, kind of like, it would be like if a, like if the president went and like stole a burger from, or like stole, went and stole something from a store. Even though like, he's like, let's say he just only went and he stole like, you know, maybe $500 worth of stuff. Um, you know, it's like not that big of a deal. But because the president did it, it's like, oh, shit. And that that's kind of the idea here, right? Peng Li going on and doing this shit was a much bigger, much bigger deal here. So beyond the moral violations, uh, Liu Peng Li supposedly going in, sneaking in, wearing a wig and fucking uh, husbands of these <laughs> warranted execution. They didn't like that. No, actually, they're, I wouldn't say like cool with homosexuality, but like it wasn't. Now, sex back then was just viewed differently. Sex between men was viewed very differently. It still wasn't like, I don't think that they weren't allowed to get married, but they were, they were going to like mess with you if you were boning, if you were a dude boning other dudes. So, but it did, it did warrant legal and administrative action from the Imperial court for his tyranny, tyranny and abuses of power. And the situation also pre- presented a very complex dilemma for the court dealing with crimes committed by a member of the royal family required the careful like trapeze act essentially of upholding the justice and maintaining the dignity and stability of the imperial lineage especially you know since you know <laughs> pengli's grandma would have, would be kind of upset upset by this accusation and be like what what the hell so <clears throat> There was a big debate after they, they found this out. Uh, the main debate was over the appropriate punishment for Liu Pengli, given the severity of his crimes. It was a very contentious issue within the Han Imperial Court. So, given the heinous nature of his actions, which included serial murder and abuse of power, there were a bunch of calls initially for his execution. They were like, yeah, hey, okay, so yeah, he's killing people. Confusion texts state this. Like, let's... uh." This would be, this is what I consider rectitude, right? You know, a life for a life. Capital punishment was viewed as many as a fitting and just response to the atrocities he had committed, which if he did commit them, I think that's fair. However, there was a lot of consideration of his royal status. Uh, Liu Pengli's status as a member of the royal family complicated the the, the decision. Executing a royal family member was not a decision taken lightly, as it had implications for the imperial family's prestige and the perception of stability within the Han Dynasty. Again, kind of like if the president went and stole $500, you know, really, I, I, like if the president went and killed someone, he'd probably get away with it because it's the president and you can't like, prison the president, we can't set that president. So, you know, we're going to uh, impeach him and he's going to get off scot-free. <laughs> or, you know, if they commit treason or do something else, it's like, you know, the justifiable sentence would normally be prison time because of their station and position. They would probably get away with, you know, at least get, get off a lot more scot-free than a normal person would. A peasant would just been executed right out. Like no, no qualms there at all, but because it's a member of the Royal family, can't mess with them because it's the president. We can't put him into jail for some reason. (laughs) God damn it. Anyways, uh, there's also a lot of legal and moral implications. The debate, all considering these, uh, would would state legally Liu Pengli's crimes warranted severe punishment, but there are also moral considerations about the sanctity of royal blood. Sanctity of royal blood, such a crazy statement, and the implications of executing a member of the emperor's own family, which would then make the emperor feel more unsafe and probably lead to more internal power struggles. So this is where we'll go ahead and get into banishment over death. The decision to banish Liu Pengli instead of executing him, despite the gravity of his crimes, was a notable deviation from the expected course of justice for what he had supposedly committed. So he he was, as part of his punishment, Liu Pengli was stripped of his title of king, obviously. 
This act was a significant form of censure, effectively removing his authority and status within the Han Dynasty. Part of this would be because earlier, uh, in the Emperor Wen's father uh, had already kind of set up this idea of like, hey, if I mess up, it's okay for you guys to like, you know, call me out on it. And, you know, if uh, another king messes up, we should all be able to get together and punish them. So a lot of this is coming from that, essentially. <laughs> this act was uh, <clears throat> very, you know, it was, it sounded like a very high precedent and kind of made some other regional kings a little nervous. But the choice to banish him, instead of imposing the death penalty, was a very notable act of leniency. Banishment meant that Liu Feng Li was sent away from the royal court and his domain, likely to a remote or less significant location, somewhere where, you know, his quims, his desires of murder and burning things wouldn't, you know, mess up the kingdom as much. <sighs> and a lot of this, again, is primarily due to his loyal royal lineage, uh, which was a critical role in the decision to opt for banishment over execution, supposedly. Also preserving imperial dignity. Uh, it, this, dev, this decision can also be very much seen as that an attempt to preserve the dignity of the imperial family. By choosing banishment over execution, the court, would avo uh, court avoided the stigma and potential controversy of putting a royal family member to death, which would have been a big deal. And people would have been like, oh, that's so... Crazy that she did that. Uh, and really, overall, this decision represents a balance between the need for justice and the practicalities of dynastic rule. While Liu Bengli's crimes warranted severe punishment, the court really did have to consider political and social implications of executing of someone of his status. So, this is where we are going to now start getting into some conspiracy theories, however. And we all love a good... A good conspiracy theory. There's a lot of speculations and rumors about a secret execution of Liu Pengli instead of his official sentence of banishment, which have arisen over time and were fueled by various factors related to his case in the broader context of Han Dynasty politics. So here are some key aspects of these rumors. The leniency by banishing Liu, despite the severity of his crimes, was very unusual especially given the Han Dynasty's legal system's typical strictness. They were very strict about a lot of things. This leniency led some to speculate that the official sentence might have been a cover for a more severe clandestine punishment. Like he was banished and then never heard of again because on his way to, you know, his new area, they went in and chopped his head off. <laughs> Probably hired some bandits to do it. The Han court might have also wished to avoid the scandal and dishonor and dishonor associated with publicly executing a member of the royal family. So a secret execution would serve the dual purpose of delivering justice while preserving the family's dignity and preventing potential unrest or controversy. And some things that are kind of aiding in this, there, there, there's, is the absence of further historical records regarding Liu Pengli's life post-banishment which provides fertile ground for speculation. I mean, part of the reason for this too is because he was stripped of his title and therefore kind of deemed a peasant and not important. And so, you know, no one would have really cared. But without concrete evidence of his life in exile, theories about a secret execution gain a lot more traction. There's not even like reports of him like arriving, which is weird. I, you'd think that like at the very least they would be like, okay, and this is when Liu Pengli died. I don't know. It's just weird. <laughs> there's just not a whole lot after after his banishment. There's nothing after his banishment is what I should say. Also, in the complex and often ruthless world of uh, imperial court politics, a secret execution could have been seen as politically expedient solution, dealing decisively with Liu Pengli while maintaining the facade of royal clemency. And this is where we're going to get into a big historical debate. So while intriguing, uh, these theories are not supported by substantial historical evidence is something I really need to, uh, I guess I establish here right now, because I, I don't want people to come back to this episode and be like, hey, so you told me this, but then my history professor said that you're wrong. Which, you know, I, I could be. I could be getting a lot of this off. Um, 
I really did try to double check my timeline and everything. There's um, there's some conf- conflicting information about the timeline. Um, but uh, other than that, I've, for the most part, I feel like I did do a lot of research here. And, you know, I'm just, the more of this, the, this is more just fun theory talk now. Now, now that the story's over and we've gone, gone over the crimes and everything, so... So, <clears throat> in in debate of this, there is a lack of concrete evidence for execution. While the theories about Liu Peng Lisi or execution are intriguing, there there they there is no substantial historical evidence at all. Primary sources such as the Book of Han um, only document his banishment, with no mention of an execution, secret or otherwise. And this debate primarily relies on official records, which tend to present a more sanitized version of of events, especially when it comes to sensitive matters involving members of the royal family. This reliance can sometimes obscure the full truth of historical events. Because, you know, people are going to write about what they want future generations to know and, and not, you know, just the ugly truth of everything that happens. And the way this... History was documented in ancient China often leaves room for interpretation and speculation primarily. These texts sometimes had political or moral agendas, which could influence how events were recorded and presented, specifically the Book of Han, too. A um, lot of Confucianism, ideals. There's a there's definitely a, a, an agenda for making the Han Dynasty look much more grand and much more righteous. Uh, than than it may have actually been. I mean, there there is a reason why. There were some rebellions happening during the Han Dynasty and why uh, Emperor Jing felt the need to make sure no nobody else had <laughs> had as big military power as uh, as the emperor did. So it's uh, when you read the Book of Han, you'll you'll realize like, oh, they're, they're just trying to make this shit look look all clean. There's a clean, shiny turd, not the dirty, true turd uh, that life actually is. And the absence of clear details about uh, Ping Li's life after his punishment does provide um, fertile ground for speculative the- theories, essentially letting anybody c- come up with whatever story they want to come up with about Li Yu Peng Li. Um, this debate also involves understanding the broader context of the Han Dynasty, including its legal practices, core politics, and treatment of royal family members. And the context is crucial in analyzing and interpreting the available evidence. So, this is where we get to um, kind of the end of this tale. Liu Peng, uh, Peng Li's legacy is uh, it is one of the earliest recorded instances, instances of a serial killer, potentially. His actions and the subsequent imperial response have been subjects of historical interest, offering insights into the nature of crime and punishment, as well as the limitations of royal privilege in the ancient Chinese Han Dynasty era. So, with that out of the way, let's go ahead and get into some uh, historical debates. If you're here just for the story, thank you for listening. I uh, hope you have enjoyed the majority of this. Now I'm going to kind of get into some more details, some more accounts, um, you know, kind of like talking about like whether or not this is true and what's going on here. And uh, But uh, if this is all you wanted to listen to, I, you know, great. If you like the, if you're liking the episode, like what I'm doing, please uh, leave a like, subscribe, um, leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Uh, I'm just trying to think. This is primarily a podcast, but the YouTube channel seems to have been getting more views as of late. Not more than the podcast downloads, but like more, you know, more people are stopping by. So I'm, I, I don't know. I'm kind of splitting my time here 50 50. This is a brief pause in the episode. Um, where I'm going to ramble a bit. So, yeah. If, uh, I know some people don't like that. I, you know, that's why I skipped it at the beginning here. I'm trying to improve. I'm trying to listen to feedback. But, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and get into uh, the historical debates. Uh, kind of bring us out of the historical quarrel today a bit early. And then we're going back into the uh, kind of like after review section. But it's going to be a lot longer and more impactful if that makes sense so just get get ready for that if you don't want that fine bye bye i love you guys have a good one but uh for the rest of you sticking around sweet let's uh keep going
All right, so for those of you sticking around, first of all, thank you. I I really appreciate it. Seriously, I I I love all of you listeners. I am so grateful that uh, I have you guys here listening to my stiff. It's really cool, man. I uh, started this show oh, like a little over a year ago. I had to take a break because of school. And uh, I love I love doing this. This is so fun. I, <laughs> I didn't think I was going to have this much fun with like the serial killer trope, but doing like the ancient history ones and doing all this like research, kind of like figuring out like, oh, did it, did it happen? Did it not happen? It's so cool. And that's what this whole section is going to be about. And what I plan on doing for future ancient serial killer episodes, I'm going to do, I'm going to kind of do this like breakdown of like uh, original accounts and early history and then continued future accounts of like, um, you know, early modern periods, like 16th, 19th centuries, and then like 20, the 20th to the 21st centuries and like discoveries that we go on. Um, I hope this is cool. I hope it's interesting for you. This, I don't know. I thought it was cool. So let's go ahead and get into it then, right? This is what we're, this is what we're trying to do here. So Liu Ping Li's story, as it has been passed down through history, presents a blend of historical facts and evolving narratives. Um, so we're going to go through like a time here, timeline here. So in the third century BC to the third century AD, the historical narrative of Peng Li is primarily derived from two key sources written during and shortly after the Han dynasty. These texts, records of the grand historian Shi Ji by Sima Qian and the book of Han, Han Shu by Ban Gu are crucial for understanding the context context and details of Liu Bengli's life and actions. Let's go, on, go into the author and context. So Sima Qian, uh, 145 to 86 BC, was a Chinese historian of the Western Han dynasty. She, or, uh, he would have actually been alive partially during the reign of Liu Pengli. You know, it would have been a baby, like a little kid, but, you know, he was actually around for that. And his re- this guy is regarded as the father of Chinese hist- hist- uh, historiography because of his highly influential work, the Siji. The Siji is a comprehensive history covering the period from the mythical Yellow Emperor to the reign of Emperor Wu of Han. It is composed of various sections, including the basic annals, tables, treatise- treatises, and hereditary houses. While the CG is an invaluable historical resource, its accounts must be understood within the context of its co- compilation. Sima Qian is often, re- uh, often relied on oral histories and existing documents, which could include biases or inaccuracies. Lots of, especially if he's covering the mythical yellow emperor. Like, I mean, we call it mythical now. Like, like of course. In the Shiji, Liu Bengli is mentioned as a tyrannical ruler who abused power and committed numerous atrocities. This work provides the basic narrative of his crimes, punishment, and the impact of his actions. So it doesn't do a whole lot of extra, though. And then we have the Book of Han. For the, the, again, this, this era of 3rd century BC to uh, 3rd century AD. Bangu, who was uh, 30, uh, born 32 AD to, and was alive up until 92 AD, was a Chinese historian and poet. He completed the Hanshu, which was a history of the Western Han dynasty, which was initiated by his father, Ban Biao. The Hanshu is, a more, de- is more detailed in certain aspects than the Siji and provides a comprehensive look at the Western Han dynasty, including political, um, political economic, cultural, and geographic information. Ban Gu's account of Liu Pengli adds details to the narrative provided by Sima Qian, uh, reinforcing the depiction of Liu Pengli's reign of terror and the consequences of his actions. This is where we get some more of the stories. And then most of the stories of his actions come from the accounts of folklore, oral, oral history, and stories that, have, uh, that can be traced back to Liu Pengli um, with historical context. Like the story of like a you know, demon king who imposed uh, wrath and fire upon his subjects until he was uh, eventually vanquished by some hero. Uh, some people can trace like those stories, stories like that back to Liu Pengli being a tyrant and being cruel in his actions, uh, inflicting murder upon people. 
So <clears throat> both texts are critical for historians to reconstruct the events of the Han Dynasty. They provide not only the narrative of Liu Pengli's life, but also insight into the governance, legal system, and societal norms of the time. Again, it gives it gives a very good reference to the culture, political court stuff that's happening at the time. Right? Uh, this is this is very important to examine and very important to understand because without that, without the context of like the rebellion of the seven princes, um, you would have never known that Emperor Jing was actually terrified of you know that rebellion happening again. And it was primarily because he smacked some dude over the head with a, like, with a board game. <laughs> Still so nuts to me. But it's, it's stuff like that. You know, that's, uh, excuse me, that it, it provides more context into the understanding of, of these ancient accounts of, um, you know, like maybe, maybe this could be why this story was fabricated. Again, part of the reason why I don't think it's fabricated, however, is because uh, Peng Li's brothers uh, didn't have shit written about them where they did something like that. So, you know, I feel like if they were going to fabricate that, they would have been like, yeah, so Liu Wu was like a serial killer. And then <laughs> like, all, all the sons were crazy. So we had to kill them all. They all had to die or, you know, they all had to be banished and stripped of their titles. But no, no, it was just Peng Li. So that's the, let's see, one of the things is kind of like, bolstering this idea of like, oh, he probably was. Yeah, it probably did happen. Anyways, by examining both the Shiji and the Hanshu, historians can cross-reference and analyze the accounts of Peng Li's life, uh, gaining a much more nuanced understanding of his actions and their historical context. And the importance of these works extends beyond the story of Peng Li, obviously. They're foundational texts for the study of early Chinese history, offering a window into the world of the Han dynasty. So, and that's Primarily what was going on during then. Um, and now we have the 5th to the 15th centuries. Uh, during the Middle Ages, spanning roughly um, from this era, the story of Liu Pengli, along with much of early Chinese history, underwent a process of transmission and reinterpretation. This period saw a shift in how historical narratives were treated and the purposes they served. So Pengli stories recorded in earlier texts like Shiji and Hanshu continue to be preserved in historical literature. These texts were copied and recopied throughout the centuries, ensuring the story's survival. During this era, historiography in China was less about challenging past narratives and more about preserving and transmitting them. So Pengli's story was thus passed down with little critical scrutiny of its details. Like no one, you know, stopped to think like, well, did did Jing, did like, you know, was there some people in the court that like, you know, hated... <laughs> Pengli and like Wu, you know, because like they, they, they banished Wu. Like <laughs> it's kind of weird that they also then banished his kid. You know, like they didn't think like that. It was more of like, okay, this is what was said, so pass this down, make sure this gets copied exactly. <laughs> it was more about just preserving shit because they want they want things like destroyed or like lost to time. So these historical texts, including the accounts of Pengli, were often part of the education for the scholarly class, thereby embedding them into the um, and the cultural consciousness of educated elites. So anybody in, in royalty would have known about Peng Li's actions and at least a little bit of a story. And the later part of the Middle Ages um, saw the rise of Neo-Confucianism, which was a revitalization and reinterpretation of Confucian thought that became dominant in the scholarly culture. Neo-Confucianism is just essentially like Confucianism plus you know, like with more thought put into it, essentially. Um, in this context, historical na narratives like that of Liu Pengli were often used to illustrate moral and ethical lessons. The emphasis was on deriving moral teachings rather than questioning the factual accuracy of the accounts. Again, it, like it was just used as like a moral like, hey, this is a bad boy. Don't be a bad boy now. And stories from history were framed within this Confucian moral context constantly serving as cautionary tales or exemplars of virtuous or corrupt behavior. Obviously, Peng Li's story, given its nature, likely served as a warning against the abuses of power and moral degeneracy, like, don't just give in to your whims, children. Be good, little boys. Don't go around and murder people. It's bad. And a lot of scholars and historians of this period typically accepted historical accounts from authoritative texts like Shiji and Hanshu at face value. Again, no questions. As all, most of these efforts were focused more on interpretation and moral instruction on critical, um, than on critical historical analysis. 
And eventually, his story would be integrated into the broader tapestry of Chinese historical narratives, forming part of the understanding of the Han Dynasty's history and, and its moral and ethical implications. The story um, would be featured in scholarly discussions and writings, not just as an historical account, but m- primarily as a tool for illustrating these Confucian principles. Kind of like, um, uh, I'm trying to think, like in the Bible, that story about the uh, boys who were in, in Babylon who were going to be burnt alive in the bowl, um, and they prayed and were re- rescued by um, an angel, by God. Uh, That story may have actually been like a historical account of like Nebuchadnezzar or um, uh, one of the Babylonian kings uh, about to like execute some people, but then, you know, felt like he needed to let them go. And then they got embellished and turned into like this moral like, hey, these were good, righteous people and they were saved because of how righteous they were. Feng Li's story is more of like the inverse of that. Like this was a bad person and he was punished despite, you know, coming from the royal line because of how bad he was. The inverse, essentially, of that that same lesson. And that's kind of like what would happen during this Middle Ages part of history for China. But the, the way this story was treated and interpreted during, during this time influenced how later historians would approach it. The story's moral and ethical dimensions continued to be emphasized in subsequent historical writings and discussions throughout the time. And then we, we have the early modern period, and this is where we, people start to get a little more skeptical about shit in the 16th to the 19th centuries. There was much more critical examination of sources during this time. There was a growing trend among, among scholars to critically examine historical sources, questioning their accuracy and seeking to identify biases or inconsistencies. So stories like that of Liu Peng Li previously accepted largely without question, began to be re-evaluate, re-evaluated. <clears throat> and scholars started to consider the possibility of exaggeration or <coughs> distortion in these traditional accounts. And as, in addition to, you know, scrutinizing, this uh, period saw the development of new methodology, methodologies for historical research and analysis. These methods emphasized the importance of corroborating evidence and cross-referencing various sources. Not just the one or two. And so the contact with Western cultures, particularly through trade and missionary work, introduced new perspectives and methods in historiography to Chinese scholars. Western influence encouraged a more comparative and analytical approach to history. This included a greater emphasis on uh, chronological accuracy and contextual understanding. Uh, a lot of this would probably would have been because of like Rome's influence. Honestly, Rome was super into preserving the history. That's why we have so much like detail and recorded accounts from like Rome and why, you know, historians are able to gloom as much information as they are because it wasn't just like one or two accounts. We had like a bunch of people writing down shit and a bunch of people like recording like, Hey, this happened here. And so you could cross reference like from all these different bits of like history and gain this like very comprehensive um, more than likely true story of like what actually happened for that time. Uh, whereas with, you know, this time period during Chinese history is, you know, again, just the one or two. Um, <clears throat> so, and this influx of Western ideas led to increased debate and scholarly extra- exchange, uh, this intellectual climate f- fostered a more questioning and an analytical approach to historical text overall for Chinese scholars. And they would, uh, begin to, Start digging up a little more. And there's a lot of scrutiny of Han Dynasty accounts. These accounts, including the story of Peng Li, were subjected to this new critical scrutiny. Scholars began to dissect these narratives, seeking clear, clear understanding of what might have actually occurred versus what was recorded. Because they started realizing, ah, oh, yeah, people might have been, you know, lying. <laughs> so this period saw the beginnings of historical revisionism where established narratives were reinterpreted in light of new evidence or through the application of new analytical techniques. And there was a growing effort to understand historical figures like Peng Li within the broader context of the time, considering social, political, and cultural factors that might have influenced their actions in the recording of their deeds. Which is what I'm trying to do. So I guess, like, my thought process is stuck in the, you know, late uh, 16th to 19th centuries here. So... 
take that with, uh, with what you will there. Uh, it's, uh, that's just how I think. Okay. <clears throat> and then uh, during this time period, we have a very heavily lasting impact on historical studies. Uh, the skepticism and method- uh, methodologies developed during this early modern period would go on to really heavily impact historical studies. It laid the groundwork for modern historical research, which values evidence, context, and critical analysis in understanding the past overall. So, <clears throat> in here, we have the significance of archaeology uh, for the modern era, or the 20th to the 21st century, which is where we're at. There's a lot of archaeological discoveries from the Han Dynasty era, including tombs and artifacts that have provided tangible context to the historical narratives. These findings offer insights into the historical cultural and political milieu of their time. In regards to Liu, Liu Pengli, um, not a whole lot was found. Liu, Wu's, um, Liu Wu, Pengli's father's remains were found. Uh, there's a line of the Han Dynasty's, um, I guess, sep- sepical, sepicures, sepicular, oh my God, I can't speak that word. Tombs, essentially. Uh, were also found, um, and there is more context given to the story and the potential veracity of it. Um, again, Liu Pengli was a real person. And the, like, he was real, just how true the story is is still kind of up for debate. So artifacts and archaeological sites have shed light on the daily life, governance, and cultural practices of the Han Dynasty, helping historians contextualize stories like that of Liu Pengli, within a more accurate historical framework and uh, beginning to understand more and more and more, realizing the importance of farmers and how Pengli supposedly tortured so many of them also caused some speculation, but then also added some like evidence to the claim of, oh yeah, no, they were super important during this time period, so the ruling class would have been pretty upset about him killing those, <laughs> killing them. Um, and then there's a lot more advanced methodologies, uh, metho- methodologies as well. Modern historians have employed a range of, um, range of these methodologies, including textual analysis, cross dis- uh, disciplinary research and comparative studies to gain a much more nuanced understanding of historical events and figures. Uh, Liu Pengli's story is analyzed in the broader context of Han Dynasty politics, so- societal norms, and the legal system providing a deeper understanding of his actions and their implications. It's also interdisciplinary approaches, which uh, the use of this uh, incorporated sociology, psychology, and criminology, among others, uh, allows for a more comprehensive analysis of Pengli's behavior and its impact. Uh, by adding this context into it, historians have found that his story does have some inconsistencies in it, like more inconsist- instance- inconsistencies than normal. But... Not enough to discredit the story at its core. And despite varying interpretations, there's a general consensus among these modern historians on the basic outline of Pengli's story, his royal status, his reign of terror, and the eventual consequences of his actions. So there's no denying that, yes, he was born to Liu Wu and was a grandson of Emperor Wen. He, he did have a somewhat reign of a terror. The exact amount is debated. And he was eventually banished or exiled, uh, for sure. Maybe even secretly killed. Uh, (laughs) But while the broad strokes of his story are agreed upon, there's still a bunch of debate regarding the specifics, such as the exact nature and the extent of his crimes and the total number of his victims. You know, some people like to say he killed 100. Other people like to say that he killed 1,000 because, you know, his game was stronger than Janine Bertega's. You know, (laughs) he killed a lot of peasants, probably, or something. (laughs) And people who are saying they killed over a thousand is just me. That's, that, that's only me. And I have uh, no proof to back that up. <laughs> so historians continue to discuss uh, the legal and political context of his banishment, um, debating why he was not executed and what this decision reveals about Han dynasty justice and politics, especially when uh, including the ideas of what Confucianism, especially back then would have called for. He definitely should have been executed despite his Royal, uh, his Royal status. Uh, so potentially there is some love from Emperor Jing that went into play for Pengli. Uh, he might have actually like cared about Pengli a little more, cared about his family a little more than some text lets on. 
So some modern interpretation of Bingley's story includes psychological and sociological perspectives, attempting to understand his motivations and the societal conditions that allowed his crimes to occur. I mean, he was king. I feel like that's not that hard to understand. He was the king. He could do whatever he wanted to an extent. Um, They were his subjects. And he probably was like just a sociopath and felt nothing. And so, you know, thought it was fun. And maybe the killing was the only bit of rush that he felt. And since he couldn't command an army to go kill a bunch of people, he, you know, just had a band of some of his buddies to go kill people. But <clears throat> this story overall remains a subject of interest, not only for its historical significance, but also for its relevance to modern discussions about power, morality, and administra- administration of justice. In summary, the modern era has brought a more sophisticated and nuanced, under- nuanced understanding of Pengli's story. Through archaeology, archaeological discoveries, comprehensive historical analysis, and a blend of consensus and debate, modern scholarship continues to shed light on this intriguing figure, potentially first ever serial killer, offering insights that go beyond the traditional narratives. And throughout history, this story has been subject to prevailing norms and methodologies of historical scholarship. While the core narrative remains relatively stable, understanding its context and nuances have evolved, especially within these modern historiographical techniques and archaeological findings. And I guess like, since I technically already did like the outro for uh, this, uh, this episode, I want to say like this ends a historical quarrel because I already did that, but uh, this is what brings us to kind of like the end of the episode. It's going to lead me into talking about some of my thoughts and feelings here now. A lot more than I did at the beginning of this part, but I just want to say I believe he did like he was a killer, like he did kill people. I think that he did, you know. I don't know. I just because of the lack of context about his brothers also not getting. You know, posed and because of the lack of like other things going on at the time, besides the whole rebellion war that happened during Liu, Liu Wu's time, but also during Emperor Jing's reign, I just there there's no reason for them to fabricate a story this crazy, um, just to get rid of some prince. There there would have been like really a bunch of other ways, but maybe not because of the rebellions. They would have been a little more cautious about doing that, so they didn't want to stir up them trouble so i don't know for me i i want to believe that it's you know like this is this guy was like a serial killer and it's like crazy and it's like cool that well not really cool but like it's just crazy that it was happening back then and you know like a king like that or someone from that sort of like i guess like royal lineage was inclined to do that which, which makes more sense i feel like more often than not for royalty there probably are more sociopaths than there than there aren't um, I think typically serial killers come from, I guess, cultures where they are enabled to act and behave in certain ways and aren't punished enough for it directly. But for that time period, even then, like there was still that kind of like, hey, if you screw up enough, I am going to kill you. Like, even if you are like royalty, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to just stick with. He was probably cruel. And he was probably a bit of an asshole. And he maybe did kill some people. I don't think it was to the extent that some of the stories claim. Like, I don't think he just went out and, like, murdered specifically for fun. But he might have been, you know, like, if someone went against him. And I think we're just lacking context of, like, oh, this person, like, stood up to him. So he decided to kill him. That's what I think probably is going on. We're just missing some context to the story here. Uh, that I wish that we had because it would provide more understanding and be a lot more interesting of a tale overall. The tale is still interesting. It's, I mean, it's still cool and getting to understand this and like some of the other stories um, are definitely going to become future episodes. Like I'm definitely going to talk about the rebellion of the seven princes uh, during Jing's reign because like killing someone over a board game is hilarious to me because my family loves board games and we wouldn't kill over them, I think. Um, I should say my extended family, like, uh, my aunts, uncles, and cousins, we all love board games. I really love board games. I'm actually making one right now. 
So that's, that's besides the point. Anyways, yeah, we wouldn't kill, but we we definitely have like gotten into arguments and got really you know really intense about it because like you, you hate losing, you know. But it's just, it's the competition that's so fun, and that's why we love it so much. But uh, so yeah, that will that that will definitely be a future episode. Um, but yeah, I. I'm going to say we're missing context. I think people just pissed him off and he killed them. And then someone went and ratted on him for, you know, killing them definitely unjustly. And the court was like, well, shit, we got to make this sound worse. And so <laughs> they're like, yeah, so he, he goes out and like he burns uh, farmers houses and he has sex with their wives. He, uh, <laughs> he kills their kids in front of them. Like, I don't know, shit like that. She's like, yeah, write that down, write that down. That's what happened. That's why we're banishing him. And they, they're like, we're, we're only telling people we banished it, but we're, we're, they definitely killed him. There's no, there's no way that they just let him go. They would have like secretly killed him. I'm positive. That's what happened. I, that you can call me a conspiracy theorist, but there's no, there's no freaking way Jing to just let him go. <laughs> Especially after he's cool with banishing his, his, um, I guess cousin brother kind of weird because fam- familial chart thing. How, however that works. I don't know. Liu Wu is like either like Jing's brother or like cousin in a way. It's really confusing. I, I tried to like, like read into it more, <laughs> but I was just like, the shit. So like it's Jing and him share a mother. I mean like half brother, I guess would be a better way to put it. Maybe <laughs> whatever. It doesn't matter. Uh, I mean, it does matter, but um, anyways, what are your guys' thoughts? Do you think it happened? Um, you know, is do you think the uh, the accounts are as accurate as possible? Do you think, I mean, like, do you think they're purposely, you know, leaving out some details? What are your thoughts on the conspiracies too? I want to like, let's just all come up with our own conspiracies for what actually happened. My, uh, my conspiracy is they, um, they turn Peng Li into a, um, uh, a butthole puppet, you know, they, <laughs> they used him as like a human puppet. Uh, they just they go in there and practice their puppeteering skills for uh, decades uh, after they imprisoned him and didn't actually banish him. And they would put on live performances with people sticking their hands up their butt. And then just like uh, they would like close their fists twice for him to like open and close his mouth, you know, and like he just had to follow. Like, and if you've messed up, he would get like stabbed a little bit. Um, that's what I like to think actually happened to Pengli uh, instead of uh, banishment. <laughs> Come up with your own. Uh, leave it. Leave it in the comments. Um, <laughs> I guess if YouTube lets you, <laughs> or email it to me, and I'll read it out on my next episode. I'll read out uh, some of you guys' conspiracy theories as to what you think actually happened to Liu Pengli. Uh, as far as that though, um, I saved uh, this rambling bit for the end here, so I'm going to ramble now. So if you guys want to leave, well, and not listen to my ramble. You're welcome to. I, I mean, I don't mind. Um, I want to give a big thank you to those who have left uh, criticism and have like let me know what they would prefer to see. That really does help the the show. It helps me improve. I'm not above it. Uh, I hope this episode is a little better. Uh, there, um, one of my listeners said they wanted me to stop saying the f word as much, or they, they're like, I just think like if you did, uh, you would come across as more authoritative and you know have a better show overall which you know i i can i can understand to degree so i feel like i i hopefully said it less during this episode um i hope this was a little more i guess uh i hope this was better for you if you are listening uh and seriously big thank you like i you know i appreciate that i i do strive to be better in what i'm doing um <clears throat> and thank you to everyone else who's been leaving comments uh likes <laughs> I'll leave in the dislikes. I get it. You know, it's the show's not for everyone. This isn't going to be, um, I don't know. It's definitely not perfect. I, I mean, I got a lot of room for improvement. I'm not going to sit here and pretend like, Oh, I'm the best. Like you guys can't tell me what to do. Like, no, it's tell me what to do. <laughs> like, Tell me how I can do better. Like I'm not, uh, I'm not going to pretend that I am all knowing and you know, I'm just, you know, just so amazing at podcasting and doing this this stuff um yeah you know if you guys have more suggestions uh, more feedback that you want to give please send it to me um you know leave it in comments 
send it to me in an email, uh, historicalquarrels at gmail.com. That's the best way to reach out to me. I'll see it super fast for those, uh, those of you that have reached out to me through there. Thank you. I appreciate that. A lot of you don't want me to read your emails, which I understand. I won't read them out. So, but just thank you for the correspondence. I, I appreciate it. I love this. I love talking to my listeners. It's fun. Really cool. Uh, talking to people that I don't know all that well. And, uh, you know what? Um, <clears throat> on that note too, um, I don't know if you guys really don't like listening to me kind of talk about like my personal life and stuff. I, I guess I understand that to a degree. I guess last step, uh, this last episode, the first part of this, I just kind of wanted people to understand like, Hey, I, I've had a crazy week. That's why this episode is like, so kind of like short <laughs> and why I'm doing this in two parts. Um, also I'm recording this on video for the first time, uh, for a historical quarrels episode, doing full video. I have been doing that for hard homies now for a little bit. And so editing is going to take some more time. And so with me uh, having thrown my wife her birthday party uh, on Sunday, on that Sunday where I was going to record, um, and then just with how late everything went, uh, that's why I just, I don't know, I felt, I felt that responsibility to you all for some strange reason of explaining like, hey, uh, (laughs) this is why it's kind of, you know, not amazing. I could definitely do better. And I'm sorry. (laughs) I just, I don't know, I felt, I felt like I had to. And maybe I don't have to, uh, you know, maybe I really don't. And, um, yeah, maybe I won't from now on. I'll just be like, listen, this is what you're getting. You, you take the sloppy Joe or you, or you leave it. Okay. Like, like when I, well, one of my kids don't want to eat, I'll be like, Hey, listen, this is the food we made. If you're not hungry, you don't have to eat it. But like, this is what you're getting. You're not, I'm not going to go get you, buy you chicken nuggets all the time. You're going to eat what we prepare. And if you, you don't have to eat it, you don't have to, I'm not going to force you to eat. But if you're hungry, this is what you're going to eat, you know? Uh, so that's what I'll start doing with you guys. I'll be like, listen, guys, this is the episode. Enjoy your sloppy Joe. <laughs> um, and if you don't enjoy your sloppy Joe, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. It's uh, but that's that's this is what I made. Uh, I will continue to do better. So just let me know how I can make the sloppy Joe better, I guess, or more appealing for you next time that I do a sloppy Joe. And then when I make a steak one day, tell me how you like your steak, you know, because that might not be to everyone's taste. Um, again, trying to improve slowly over time here. Uh, but seriously, big thank you to everyone, uh, to all my listeners. I love you guys. I appreciate it so much. I hope uh, you have been enjoying this content, this journey with me. I've been learning so much uh, about myself, <laughs> about uh, how to do things. Uh, sorry about this. I know the thumbnails are going to be weird. For a bunch of people, like, I, already, I already know, I already know I've done some weird ones, especially that cat one. That was weird, but I'm going to work on that, trying to get better. I'm trying to get better at editing, um, doing this all on my own until I start like, really until this starts like making money on its own. I'm not going to dump more money into it per se. I might, I, if I actually, I, who knows? I might, I love doing this so much that I honestly might, but <clears throat> I will do my best to give you guys uh, the best experience possible as a listener. Uh, That is my goal. And um, I, the only thing I need from you guys is feedback. I just need feedback. I need to be told like, Hey, I, you know, I didn't like this. Like I had some guy just be like, I didn't like the voices you, you do. And I'm like, okay, that's, I just, I think I commented, but I just replied like, okay. Um, which is fine. You know, if you don't like the voices, uh, but, uh, you know, that's just one person too. So I have to take that into context. Like, oh, it's just one person, but like, if that's everybody, um, so I'm going to like, you know, play around here and there, see, you know, what works, what doesn't work. Um, and until I eventually come into something that's good and is consistent, makes me feel happy, you know, makes me happy to make this. Cause I'm not going to just like twist and morph until I'm like, does this please you master? And like, I'm suffering the whole time. Like, are you pleased? Are you pleased by my contortion? Um, I'm not going to do that. Like I want to still enjoy making this show, obviously, but I will take feedback and I will implement it in different ways. Um, you know, I might not implement it perfectly. There might be some things where, you know, like, oh, he's still doing this, or, but like he's doing it less. I don't know. Hopefully, you know, if, if I do something, realize I'm doing it because like I like it and I have fun with it. Um, <clears throat> and if, you don't like it. Tell me that's more than fine. You can tell me and I will reduce it or I will 
I'll take into consideration. If there's a bunch of people that are agreeing with you, then I'll be like, okay, you know, yeah, yeah, I can cut that out. Uh, Cause I'm not going to do something that like makes you guys just turn off the episode automatically. I don't want to do that, but uh, that's all for me. You guys have a good one. I love you all. Goodbye. Peace.